Thanks, Mitchell. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Ann Gerwitz, and this is the third session in Track 1, Planning and Communicating IT Changes and Outages. I'd like to remind everyone that all attendees have been muted and the discussion will be recorded. And if you have any questions, please leave your contact information and questions in the chat. And I would now like to turn the mic over to our moderators for the discussion. It's uh, Linda Ong, Director, IT Communications, University of British Columbia, and Sherry Thompson, Director, Director Faculty Technology Center, Louisiana State University. Linda, Sherry. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Um, we have a great session planned ahead. We've got four really wonderful panelists. Um, so I want to just jump right in because I know this is a topic of interest for many of us, either on the communication side or not. Um, and looking forward to the questions that we have uh, coming up in the chat. So again, my name is Linda Ong. I am the Communications Director for the Office of the CIO over in uh, the University of British Columbia in beautiful Canada. Uh, we'll be, I'll be your co-moderator for this session on planning and communicating IT changes and outages, along with my co-moderator, Sherry Thompson, who will be moderating the chat for questions. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm, uh, I'm hosting the session this morning from my home office. Um, and I would like to acknowledge and thank the Coast Salish Nations of Musqueam, the Salwatooth, and the Squamish um, for their stewardship on the land on which I work and live. Um, over to our panel of experts. We have four. They're on the slide deck right there. Um, I will briefly introduce each of them. We've got Lacey from Texas. We've got Matthew from North Carolina. We've got Al uh, from Rutgers. And we have someone from my team from Canada, uh, Winnie. So welcome to all of our panelists. Um, these sessions are actually quite short, so I do want to leave quite a bit of time, not only for our experts to share their thoughts, but to get right into the Q&A as well. So with that, um, I would actually like to start with a couple of questions for our panelists, each one by one. And uh, if you can just uh, be reminded to keep your answers brief so that we can go through each of the panelists. Um, and we have three questions. And the first one that I want to start with is a little bit of a combined introduction of who you are and sort of what do um, IT changes and outage communications look like in your area? So the first question is, what is your role with respect to communicating outages, both planned and unplanned? Um, and what responsibilities do you and or your team have? And I'm going to start with Lacey, if you don't mind sharing your perspective. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so my role has increased significantly. I'm the director of product strategy and communication at Texas A&M University. Um, so my role has increased significantly over the past five years, I think, due to increased customer expectations and also a few high profile outages in a row. And so my team created a new incident communication plan and we categorize the outages in, in three different ways and our roles differ for each. So we have basic outages and degradations, we have major incidents, and then plan outages or maintenance. So if the outage is minor, our operations center will post the information on our IT alerts website without me. So I've coached them how to communicate clearly, and then I will monitor the posts and every now and then provide every now and then provide them feedback if I see something that needs it. Um, another big change that I implemented implemented at this stage uh, was to reduce the lag time uh, for posting incidents. In the past, the operations center would try to verify the outage themselves or wait for technical details to come in. And I've told them if we're getting multiple calls about the same incident, then there's obviously an issue and we need to acknowledge it immediately. We can always say that we're receiving reports of an outage and then add the technical details later. So if things escalate to major incident level, then my involvement changes immensely. And um, while it's difficult to define major incident and have an example for every single scenario of a major incident, we've just defined it as a technical issue that is preventing many campus members from achieving their mission. So internet outage in a dorm, basic incident. The whole, the campus internet goes down during the day for over 15 minutes, then it becomes a major incident. So when a major incident is initiated, all of the leadership across our division receives a text message and an email. Um, if they don't acknowledge that within 10 minutes, 
then the system automatically pings their secondary contact and so on. And at this point, we all join a Zoom meeting and I take over communications. Uh, major incidents are high profile. There's a lot of eyes on what we're doing and it can impact our reputation. And it's important that our communications are clear and focused and at times strategic. Um, we're committed to publishing an update every hour on the half hour. Um, and as obviously we would post more often if additional information becomes available. And I think later I'll get into more about how that works. Um, and at this point, I also engage Texas a and central social media team um, and ensure that they get a post out on all of their channels. Um, but we do not try to get our outage posted on as many channels as possible. I found that that sets expectations that updates and future outages will be posted there. And we want our IT alert site to be the sole source of information. Um, if the outage is planned, uh, we have a very uh, well-defined change management process. So I see every change that comes through. Um, our IT professionals are required to detail how they will communicate about their plan maintenance. And most of the time, a basic IT alert or post on our website will suffice. But if it is a little, you know, large, will have a larger impact, then my team will get involved and provide additional communications. Um, one thing that probably a lot of you have, but that has definitely helped reduce the need for tons of plan maintenance communications is having a set uh, maintenance window. And we currently have that for our major services. I think it's a Saturday morning once a month. So, um, so just to sum it up, my team uh, created the overall outage communications plan and then we monitor it and work to improve it regularly. And then when the shit ish hits the fan, I said it, oh no, um, we take over communications. I think we all feel that way sometimes when things happen. So um, don't worry about about it fully expressing yourself, Lacey, as a communicator. Um, I was supposed to say ish. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> so Al, I mean that that's a very comprehensive. Lacey gave us a very comprehensive um, view of her world, and I know that there's probably some similarities that the rest of the panelists have as well. Um, maybe give us the inside scoop on what what it's like in your world at Rutgers and. Are there some differences than what um, Lacey had offered us in her purview? Sure, thanks, Linda. So I, I think Lacey, I, I feel like I'm already learning some things based on what Lacey said. I, I really like the way Lacey laid it out in terms of there's the major incidents, there's the planned ones, and also there are some of those more basic ones. Uh, I think that that can be a helpful framework. So I think in in my role, we are really key players in our efforts to um, communicate outages and, and changes. And one of the things that we've really done is set up a process to make have that make sense. Um, when I landed into this role about three years ago, there was somewhat of a process. Some of what we've done since then is really codify that process and move it forward. And as part of that, we had a major website overhaul. And in that major website overhaul, we created a whole new system and process for those outages where we really, um, it was a little bit more ad hoc and we had previously, whereas now we have really formalized those things. And the way our process generally works is that when we learn of an outage, and that can happen any number of ways. It can happen just by calls to the help desk, or it can happen by um, a call from a service owner. We do just what Lacey said. We try to communicate as quickly as possible, and we make a point not to think, hey, we have to go back and figure out root causes. So we're just very clear in our processes and working and um, socializing those processes with other IT staff at Rutgers to make clear that, you know, our goal is really to, mean, to communicate to those faculty, staff, and students and make clear something is up. We may not know what it is. We don't know the reasons, but we just want people to go to one place on our website at this alerts page and really know that that's where they can find that key information on you know, whether something is down, um, 
and get updates there. So it, it's, it's quite similar. Um, my team's role in that is typically to be a key player in thinking through what those messages are, whether they are messages that we're going to post and we usually do post them or help desk staff will post them. So I'm on, I lead the IT communications team and we work very, very closely with the help desk on these efforts with the understanding that the help desk is really playing the role of interfacing with the service owners. But one thing we have made clear, and it goes back to something I think that, that Lacey mentioned, was just that, you know, we, we, while the service owners may sometimes really want to wait and say like, okay, you know, we're not sure, maybe it's a big deal, maybe it's not. At the beginning of one of these things, you really don't know. And we have built that into our process that at the beginning, we often don't know whether this is a major incident or whether it's something minor, but we are going to communicate about it so that members of the community really have some sense that something is up and they can just check back and get more information. Thanks. And I'll leave it at that. So. Thank you. Sure. Um, maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to Winnie. I, I see a question has come up as well in the chat. So maybe this is something, um, Winnie, that you can address a little bit in your answer in terms of um, your role with respect to communicating um, outages and the responsibilities that the comms team has. In the chat, it says, if you have a team of communication folks, which we do at UBCIT, um, how do you maintain a similar language or style? Um, so maybe over to you, Winnie, in terms of how we uh, communicate planned and unplanned outages and a bit about the team's role. Mm -hmm. uh, so for planned outages, uh, we work very closely with our service owners. Um, and that's also very similar to what Lacey and I were saying about um, if it's an issue that um, our service owner contact us about, um, if it's something that's more um, brought, need to be broadly communicated. Um, and so we do um, have a bit of a communications template in terms of um, making sure we have the right channels identified um, and then the stakeholders. And in my role for my fellow teammates as well, we um, draft the communications and also distrib distribute it. Uh, for unscheduled outages, um, for us, we have a checklist that we also follow in terms of step-by-step -step of the channels we want to communicate as well. So my role would be from those um, unplanned outages to identify the key messages and making sure it's also posted on our communication channels, like um, our Twitter account, um, our bulletin, and possibly even coming up with additional communication channels. Sometimes it's a dedicated web page to the issue. Um, so my role will also be monitoring social media and also working with my fellow teammates on that. Um, and also reaching out to our central communication team at um, the University of British Columbia, just to alert them um, um, in case that they need to be informed if there's media contacting them as well. Thanks, Winnie. Uh, Matthew, over to you. Oh, you're on mute. You'd think after a year and a half or decade and a half of Zoom, we'd all know how to unmute, but apparently not. Um, I think our themes are very consistent with, with those that Lacey, Al, and, and Winnie uh, talked about. Um, my role is a little bit unique. I'm not actually a, a communicator. I'm the major incident manager, so my job is really more of the, the instigation and the facilitator. Um, and, you know, it's, it's encouraging to hear some of the concerns and some of the challenges that others have. Um, you know, as everybody knows, hindsight's always perfect. Like after an incident, you can always look back and go, oh, well, you know, after this second ticket, we knew that there was a problem. But that's really difficult to do in the heat of the moment. And so one of the, the objectives that I'm really trying to encourage is, uh, and I heard somebody mention it in one of the presentations earlier, is, you know, really this is a no-fault environment. Like we, when we communicate about an outage, whether it's a major one or whether it's a basic one, we're not pointing fingers. We're not blaming a service owner. You know, IT stuff breaks. It's just the nature of the game. If it didn't, we'd all be unemployed living on a beach somewhere. Um, and so, you know, trying to communicate, trying to get that notice onto the status page early on. So that's really what, what I'm doing is trying to early into the process 
get information from the service owners, get that information to our uh, 24 by seven operations center, have it posted on our status page, get the same content to the service desk, get it out to that customer entry points so that one, it's consistent information, um, but also just so that we can, can help facilitate all of our, our IT colleagues across campus to let them know that yes, there is a problem and yes, we know about it. Um, you know, we, we hear stories constantly about people going down the road of investigating whether is it a problem with their stuff? Is it a problem with something else? And they're kind of doing that in a vacuum because, um, you know, we've either not intentionally, but we've dragged our feet a little bit in, in announcing that there is an, in fact, an issue because we really wanted to do that due diligence of making sure, yes, this is a real confirmed issue before sharing something. Um, and so really trying to push that information out earlier. And then also, um, you know, helping to, to escalate that up so that if it is an, an ongoing, you know, major significant event, that we are pulling in our, our IT executive council, our other senior IT um, colleagues from across campus to make sure that they're looped in, to make sure that their, their staff out in the field are also getting the information that they need. And it's also a two-way conduit so that we can get information back from them if we need more for root cause analysis. Thanks, Matthew. Um, I want to get on to, there is a question about whether or not people have formal or, formal or informal processes. So I will get to that question, but if I can just um, ask another question that was in the chat. For the panelists, including Sherry and myself, um, how many of us have dedicated IT communication teams? Hands up. And with those hands up, how many people are on your, how many communicators do you have on that team. So, you know, it ranges, right? It's, they're not big teams. They're not big teams considering the scale of some of these major outages that we know about. Um, and I don't know how it works for the rest of you, but at UBC, we have a rotation. So we have um, a primary communications person and a secondary one as backup every month throughout the whole calendar year. Um, and that's kind of how we manage um, making sure that we're covered in terms of always having communication support. But that kind of feeds into our next question. And, um, you know, I'm conscientious of time, so I'll kind of move it along. But how many of you have a formal versus informal process? And I mean, considering the nature of unplanned, uh, unplanned outages, you know, what kind of works and how have you had to be adaptable and flexible um, with some of your processes. And maybe I can start with you first, Al. Um, what's the situation like at Rutgers? Sure, we do have a formal process for that, but it does allow for flexibility. Um, and so as part of that process, we, when we detect an incident, a Slack channel is, uh, we, we have a Slack channel with the deputy CIO on it, I'm on it, uh, directors and other people who are members of the help desk and other members of my team. And that's really where we discuss those things and move things forward. So the pro as part of the process, we know that is where these things get discussed and who the key players are and what their roles are in that particular channel. The help desk is working with the service owner. My team is crafting the sort of communications, dec deciding whether it needs to be escalated beyond our usual channels, which is this IT alerts page. Things also get posted to Twitter and Facebook automatically and to a, another Slack channel from there. So that's all part of the process, but there is some flexibility built in um, to allow for those situations when we really need to escalate things. So I'm curious for Matthew, who is sort of like when, when these things get called, um, who is at the table um, for the for once you start getting into that actual crisis mode? Who's who's at the table? Who's represented in your particular areas? So so as part of our, um, we also have a, a a structured process. You know, we do uh, account for a flexibility because, as everybody knows, every every incident, every outage is pretty unique. Um, but part of that process is if it, if it is a significant outage, if it involves one of our predetermined, pre-identified core critical campus-wide services, we automatically initiate a, a conference call, you know, notifications going out and then bringing in um, our senior leadership. So the people that that call goes out to are the, 
our ITS uh, associate vice chancellors, those senior directors, uh, and then representations of other key common areas. So it's a representation from our operations, our 24 by seven operations center, our service desk, our uh, senior directors for um, operations on the IT side, our, our enterprise applications senior directors. So it's, it's an attempt to get kind of that broad cross segment of our IT services portfolio on, on every single call because most of what they provide is involved, you know, it's, it's all this integrated environment. And then in addition to those common individuals, bringing in the team manager, the service owner for the particular service that, that is um, in the middle of that impacting event. So I want to talk a little bit because, you know, in between the formal and informal process, there is this question of speed, right? Getting the speed is a factor in getting your communications out. And regardless of how small or big our teams are, that is always sort of a pressure point for all of us. So for Lacey and Winnie, I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering, you both spoke a little bit about um, the different communication channels that you use to distribute the messages. Um, some use social media, some stick to the tried and true. Um, my question to you is how do you discern which channels to use quickly depending on the situation at hand. Um, I mean, it, it might be a checklist, but is there something else that you use to base your judgment on in which channels to use and when? Uh, maybe we can start with you, Lacey, and then over to Winnie. Sure, um, I think um, initially, you know, whenever we were managing crises that we felt this need to to try and go post our outages on as many channels as possible um, as quickly as possible and I just realized that that became cumbersome and then it crossed my oh my it crossed my mind that they're going to expect me to post all of the updates there as well and so whenever we were overhauling our communication process um, it became clear to me that we needed one hub to be the place where we post all of our alerts and we need to do a huge campaign to ensure that all of the campus knows that that is where we will post, you know, IT outage information and updates. Um, so, and as far as speed goes, we don't, we intentionally do not worry about sending out emails to the entire campus or, you know, trying to work with all of the leaders of all of the colleges across campus in the major incident status until we kind of get out of that crisis mode. Our, our main goal is just to post updates at least once an hour on our IT alerts website. And then we will go back later and focus on filling in the details and root cause analysis, et cetera. Winnie? Uh, so similar, similar to Lacey in a bit. Um, so for us, we do have our th uh, main channel. So it would be our bulletin site. We also, which is also our status page um, to uh, mention any of the operational status of enterprise services um, and also our, our Twitter channel. Um, our IT service help desk actually has um, its own Twitter channel and uh, they would basically post a tweet every time, you know, we have an update and um, the general IT department at UBC, we would actually retweet them. So it's a single source of truth. Um, so those are our main channels. And then once we have like the key messages and the target audience, the stakeholders identify, we then um, come up with other channels that we need to broadly communicate it. So similar, just really based on what the situation is and just deciding the channels that we target and we just monitor them. And similar to what Lacey said, um, every time we get an update from a meeting that we would have, we would make sure those uh, main channels are updated um, and just making sure that um, the information is uh, communicated and um, until the situation is resolved, then um, that's when we close off the communications. Real quick, can you, um, as a follow-up, talk a little bit about what you communicate? Like there's a difference between being transparent and giving all the down and dirty details that no one actually wants to hear or needs to hear. And that's maybe maybe detrimental to the brand and protecting the brand. Can you, can you speak a little bit about what those action, what what transparency looks like and means to your organizations? Mm -hmm. um, so for us, we just we make sure that you know the message is clear, especially for the end user, because we have a lot of people who are not very technical. Um, so we make sure that we get the key information, so the impact, the situation, uh, what the situation is. 
Um, and then we always inform them of where to contact us if we have any questions. So we try to make sure, keep the language very calm. Um, we don't really, we try not to include too much technical information if it's not the right audience. And then if there's a channel that's more technical, that's when we sort of provide a bit more details. Lacey and, and Matt, can y'all talk a little bit about that too, real quick? So maybe always blame the vendor. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, no, no, yeah, that so, is totally uh, legit. That is yeah, totally so, legit. <laughs> so um, I will say that, yes, I do think that when things become a major incident and all those eyes are looking at your posts, um, there is that communications expertise that's needed. Maybe start using passive voice instead of active voice and, you know, using your um, your communication skills there. Um, but we also try to, when it's a major incident, we are not trying to give out the technical details or root cause analysis. We are focused on what, is hap what happened, but not technical, how it impacts their life, what services are available or not available, and then a expected time of resolution. Yeah, I think we're we're doing you know the same kind of focus. You know, speak in the language that the customer understands. Talk to them about what it what and how it actually affects them. Uh, you know, we joke about blaming the vendor, and we all laugh because we all do it. We had a uh, a retired service director who who ran a very centrally everybody used it service. And, you know, by the very nature, it had issues. And he was an absolute master in blaming the vendor and making it sound like he wasn't blaming the vendor. Um, you know, more and more as we become cloud dependent, that's what we do a lot. Um, you know, as, as email is, is moving off prem and into the cloud with whatever provider you're doing, we're really up to them. Uh, you know, they release as whatever, either full or limited in most cases information, and we're really just kind of parroting that back. And so it really is important to speak to the users. You know, we all have a, 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 a constantly cycling student body population that is either sometimes familiar with a service that we call it, but most times they're totally familiar with it by a completely different name. You know, they don't know what it's email to them. And so calling it by the brand name or calling it by, you know, our creatively uh, you know, implementation of that service doesn't always help. And so trying to, to again, speak in that, that clear language is very helpful. I would just say ditto to what the other said. Yeah, really focus on the impacts. That's what we're doing. I would also be interested to hear if there's time later, how everyone is handling communicating about outages of your cloud-based services. Mm -hmm. um, because it kind of seems like now, not only am I, you know, we're responsible for managing communications for all the services that we provide, but when there's, you know, something's wrong with Microsoft, am I supposed to be the one that is communicating that out to everyone? Or do we link to Microsoft's channel? You know, how does that work? And there's probably not enough time to discuss, but... <laughs> That's next level, Lacey. That's our, that, that will have to be our next uh, community session dedicated to that because I think that is something that all of us will have to, are either dealing with right now or will have to do um, very soon in the near future. I'm conscientious of the fact that we've got two minutes left um, and the conversation absolutely can continue in the virtual coffee lounge afterwards for those of you who have the time. I would like to kind of um, end with one final question for all of our panelists. And um, it's a question more around um, how has outage communications or you know, even communicating IT changes, has, how has it changed over time for all of you? And I know we just came out of a very extraordinary year where many things were sort of left a, um, fully out in the open. But in terms of like the history of, of you working in this field and you know having to deal with being proactive and reactive, what has been maybe like one of the greatest lessons that you've learned um, in moving forward? So I'm going to start with Matthew uh, and then we'll go over to Lacey. Oh, I was hoping you would pick somebody else so I could use uh, Al's ditto. Um, I think it's it's what we were just talking about. It's it's that transition from on-prem where you had your hands around all of the service from the hardware, storage, network, everything up to the top to cloud where you have this little glimpse. And in many times, you know, you're really beholden to your user community in reporting back uh, that they're impacting things. 
uh, you know, we've got 60,000 users across campus. And so even if it is a, a Microsoft significant outage, there's no guarantee that it affects everybody. You know, it could be this slice of this partition of this whatever else. And so, you know, trying to understand what the actual impact is when you have very limited visibility into that the service is, you know, continues to be one of our big challenges. So, yeah, so at, um, at Texas A&M, I would say over time that expediency is key and that customers and the campus members expect us to push the notifications to them. Um, and I think they have gotten used to, you know, their home internet provider. Netflix is messaging them whenever it's down and they expect the same from us. And so really figuring out how to be more proactive in getting the message to them instead of expecting them to go find your outage alert on a website somewhere is definitely the biggest change of the future for me. So we have, you know, text message alert systems and the whole nine yards. Winnie, uh, biggest change you've seen in the history of outage communications? Um, I have to say, like, definitely, like, adding more tools to your skill set. So uh, definitely, I mean, each outage is quite different. So we went from just even, like, if our email, staff email is down, we had to use our personal email accounts. Um, if we can't even email each other, we have to show up in person. So um, adding a lot of technology, but also using some of the traditional um, methods as well. And I think um, that's been a great change in terms of just coming up with new ways to communicate and not just our, you know, typical traditional tools, but also just expanding it a little bit. Winnie, that actually brings me to one of the questions that was in the, in the panel, and that really is like, what are those tools and mechanisms if the tool that you use is down. So like you have a plan A and maybe that's the alerts page. Maybe you have a plan B that's like an, a listserv. But if your network is down, what is your plan C? And then how do your customers know? Can you kind of talk about um, kind of what that is? And we'll start with Winnie because you were just talking about that and kind of go into what your how, how the customers would know and how you communicate to the customers and where to go for those kinds of changes. Mm -hmm. So for us, our main tool is definitely email communications and our bulletin site. Um, we also have a mailing list for, um, it's called uh, Dedicated for a System Network and Administrator Group, which actually is um, a mailing list that contains um, a lot of the IT professionals at UBC, and also just anyone that wants to tap into IT news. So we do take advantage of that mailing list quite a bit to broadcast any major outages and IT news. Um, and just going to um, thinking about like any other tools as a backup, um, we do tap into our other type of um, tools such as uh, mobile apps, such as like, uh, I know some groups have done WhatsApp for us, um, uh, so even Slack and all those other additional channels, um, just as a backup if any of our major tools don't work. Great, thanks. Al, what about for Rutgers? What goes on there? Sure, we have a system based on our website, which is hosted externally. So we, we're usually pretty safe, confident of that we're going to be able to post alerts at that website. Um, of course, we use other tools like email and so forth, um, but it, that is our key resource. And I think that that's one of the, that has been one of the key lessons that we've had over time is just rather than relying on too many tools and having people expect that they would be able to get alerts at every place, which is increasingly hard to manage. If we really funnel people to this one URL, that's the resource that they are going to know to go to. And of course, that brings up something that I, I think um, Lacey mentioned is, of course, you have to communicate about that resource to other people. And, and I think that that is, that is a challenge that you know we are dealing with and, and could be a whole other topic for discussion, so. Matt? Um, you know, using similar things. So our, our, our primary focus is that, that external status page. Um, we send out an email um, for major incidents, but it doesn't go to everybody. It goes to our, our you know, campus technology consultants list, which is um, IT staff across campus. I think one of the benefits of, of trying to point people to that central web portal is the moment we send an email, 
it's out there. You know, if there's a typo, if there's missing information, if we need to correct something 30 seconds later, it's gone. Whereas by, by constantly updating what's on that website, we can point people there and it's always, well, theoretically, always the most current information that we know. And so trying to keep that message consistent and redirecting people back. I think the, the comments and the experiences that, that others have shared today about, you know, first off, trying to push it to as many places and then realizing absolutely that you just set that expectation. And it was hard enough to get the information out there the first time. It's definitely going to be an ongoing challenge continuing to update all of those places where if we can consolidate it back to a few key locations, we start to over time train our users. Oh, I'm experiencing something strange. Well, let me go here to look for that. Um, so it's, it's, you know, that, that portal, uh, the, the external and, and ours is also off campus so that we hope to hedge off any, any on campus uh, originating issues. And then also pushing that information to our service desk, you know, whether it's chat, whether it's voice, whether it's walk in when we get back to that part of life, uh, you know, those are another super big customer entry point. And so trying to cross as many of those, you know, as many of our campus users, but in as few places as possible is, has really been successful. So, so um, Lacey, I'm not going to ask you that same question. I'm going to yeah, ask you a different fine. question. Um, real quick, one of the people wanted to know, like, when you have a, an actual staff of communicators, how do you create a single voice? And is, do you need to? I mean, is it, is it even possible to have, a, like, one voice coming out of that? Or what tools do you use to kind of get everybody in the same language using? So, I guess there's, there's different types of... So after, after the incident has occurred and we're sending out emails, you know, to all of campus and it's more, you know, the formal, not in an emergency mode, um, all of our communications funnel up through me and I would see them before they go out. And I think that helps ensure that consistent voice. And over time, you know, as you provide edits and coaching, it just kind of the single voice sort of forms. Um, but I will say there is a difference between the communication received for basic outages, which is most of our alert posts. And then whenever my team takes over in a major incident, um, by nature, the help desk staff is more technical. And, you know, I try to coach them that not everyone knows what a UPS is. And, you know, obviously they've gotten a lot, a lot better at that. But I think that it's more important that the message get out there fast and that the help desk is set up for a 24 seven operation. If everything had to go through someone in communications, that would be a huge nightmare. And so, you know, while I try to coach them and have great communications, I'm, there is a noticeable difference between when my team takes over and the daily posts for maintenance and outages or basic outages. Thanks, Linda, I'm gonna bring it back to you since we have two minutes left. Um, I just wanted to see there was a couple of other very quick um, questions uh, remaining in the chat that I would try to like to get through. One of them was from Joyce. She's wondering if anyone on our panel currently uses ServiceNow major incident module. Hands up if you use it. So two of the four, do you find that beneficial? Is it something that you will continue using? So, so I will say my team, um, we might, while we provide the content that goes into the module, we do not work inside of the module, but it, it has, it's cloud-based and not dependent on any internal infrastructure and has worked great for the past several years that we've been using it. We also use it. it it's a great foundational start. Um, they're just like all of the uh, other ServiceNow modules. It, it has some strong other dependencies. And so it may or may not be useful for your environment. Um, you know, it's, I, we wouldn't stop using it. Um, and we're continuing to try and enhance our practices and the information that's in there to make it more uh, functional and effective. Great. Thank you both. We are right on the dot at 1124 turning 1125. Thank you for the correction on my time. I was jumping ahead. Um, if you have any additional questions or you'd like to reach out to any of the panelists, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, we've got our contact information on the slide and I'm sure we'd be happy to share our, 
our templates, our checklists, our thoughts on any questions you may have that we didn't get to in today's session. Uh, and so, with Linda, that, would you mind? Yes. I actually don't have your, I mean, I have your email address, but not on a slide. Do you want to maybe for the sake of the attendees post your each of your email address in the chat? Um, or, you know, and I could put them on the slide you see here and send that out as uh, afterwards as well. And real quick, a, a plug for the um, IT communications uh, <laughs> group. So if you're part of Educause, um, we talk about these things endlessly on our listservs and with each other. So if you're interested in communications, um, please join uh, the, the IT comm group. Okay. Thank you, Linda, Sherry. Thank you, all the panelists. And um, Mitch, if you could stop recording. <laughs>